So this is a famine that really covers a great area. But anyway, okay, there you go. I've never seen such ugly cows in the land of Egypt. <laughs> the lean, ugly cows, cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first. That's how I felt when I looked in the mirror after I pulled off my beard. <laughs> never seen such an ugly cow. Oh, boy. Okay, go ahead. But even after they, they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly <laughs> as before. And then I woke up. In my dreams, I also saw seven heads of grain, full and good, growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin, and scorched by the east wind. By the east wind. Have I told you about the east? Yeah, never mind. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, now what is the, uh, in Daniel we have kind of the same thing where he has a dream and what does Daniel do that's a little different than the, uh, the dream that's in this one? Anybody know? Yeah, he didn't tell his magicians what the dream was. He required them to tell. That's right, which was... That's right. It, 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 did you all get that? Is that in this, here Pharaoh says, I had this dream, and everybody was at least honest enough to say, we don't know what it means, right? But in Daniel's time, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he says, I had a dream last night, and it was really, really disturbing to me, and, and I want you to tell me what the dream is and what it means. And everybody's like, okay, well, go ahead and tell us. And he's like, no, 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 you don't understand. I want you to tell me what the dream is, and then you interpret it. And he said, okay. Tell us the dream and we'll interpret. And he says, you don't understand. Your life is forfeit unless you can tell me what I dreamed. And, unless, and they said, well, nobody can tell what a dream is except the gods. You know, and so he really had them in a box. And that's when, good memory there. Daniel and his uh, uh, three friends fasted and prayed. And God revealed the dream to him. And then he went before him and he says, same thing as Joseph. I can't. This comes from God. So anyway, there is a God in heaven, he says, that can interpret your dream for you. So uh, I think it's Daniel 4. Seeing as how I'm talking about it, and you might want to refer to it later, let me just see. I think it's Daniel chapter 4, which is right after Ezekiel. And it says here, um, oh, no, I'm sorry, it's Daniel 2. The other dream is Daniel 4 that I was thinking of, but this is Daniel 2. And uh, the king gave the command to the magicians, the sorcerers, sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell his dream so they could came and stood before him. And the king said to them, I have had a dream. My spirit is anxious to know the dream. Chaldeans spoke to the king, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give you the interpretation. And it goes on from there. Anyway, so Daniel 2, fun story. Please, go ahead. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one of the same dream. And the seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain. Okay, so why did... By the, east by the east wind. Why did he do it without looking ahead? Why did he give the dream twice? Why didn't he just give him one dream? Double portion. <laughs> yeah, double portion. He's going to explain it in the next couple verses, but I want you to think through if you, if you don't remember. Why would he give the dream twice with cows and with grain if, in fact... Because the famine was going to be twice as bad. Just no. Well, that's what I thought it was. Well, no, he's going to say because God has determined it. Oh, okay. And he's not going to change his mind. Yeah, it, it, it is sure and it is determined. So in order to make sure that... He understood 100% that this was, but that was a good answer. I like that. You know? I, thought, I thought he did say that, um, that... Well, let's read it. Yeah, I may be wrong. In, in, no, I remember what you say now, but I thought there was also something about that. Yeah, I don't think that it's twice as bad, but it, God had determined this is what's going to happen, and that's all there is to it. I'm not changing my mind, and that's why I'm giving it in two different ways. But we'll see, because you might be right. There may be more that I'm just forgetting. Anyway, please, go ahead. Seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. When all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and famine will ravish the land, 
the abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. Right. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. Okay, in other words, at other times God relents in the Bible. When the Ninevites repented, put on sackcloth and ashes, God withheld his hand from destroying Nineveh, okay? In this case, it wouldn't have mattered what they did. This is going to happen. He is going to work out his plan, and he has a plan, and it is going to come to pass. And what is that plan? We know. The brothers have to come down to meet him and to bow down to him and to fulfill all of the things that God had already predetermined before he ever created the world. So in this case, it's not going to change anything. Twelve people need to understand a lesson, and also the people of Israel afterward need to understand the lesson. And so no matter what people do, it's not going to change. Whereas Assyria really had no bearing on what was going on other than, you know, in other words, God can relent from this if they change. Now, that's not to say that God didn't know that they were going to relent. He did, okay? Before he ever created the world, he knew that they would relent. But in this case, it wouldn't have mattered whether they, it wouldn't matter what they did. God has determined it. Okay, anyway, go ahead. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years and are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country will not be ruined by the famine. Okay, why did he say store up one-fifth of the grain? Why would he do that? It's obvious, but you, it's good to think it through. Well, I don't know, but apparently... If well, if you, you know, store up one-fifth, that means you have more. If you only store it up one-seventh, you have just enough for seven years. If you store up one-fifth, you have a surplus. And so not only do you have a surplus, that is enough to get you through the seven years, but you also have a surplus where you can profit off of it. Yeah. That is why he said one-fifth. Okay, it, it does make sense, but you know, the first time I read it, I was like, why you know, a it, why a fifth when a seventh is, is you know, all you need? It's, yeah, exactly. So that's why he said a fifth, is to make sure that there was no lack at all, and in fact, there would be abundance. Okay, because it's such an abundant harvest that it's going to take care of anything for seven years anyway. No matter how severe the seven years are, if you plan with one-seventh, it's going to carry you through because it's such an abundant harvest. But one-fifth is going to exceed that. Okay. So seven-fifths. What's that? It's seven-fifths. Seven-fifths, that's right. It's two-fifths more than necessary. Thank you. Very good, thank you. That's why they were able to sell the lands. Which right. Which is what brought the brothers down. Everything here is being worked out according to God's wisdom given through Joseph. Absolutely. Okay, go ahead. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man who in one, uh, can we find any, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one oh, so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Okay, and that's a picture once again of Jesus. Sitting at the right hand of God, he has all authority. Is there anyone like him in which is the Spirit of God? As I said last night, talking about the Spirit, and I don't have the quote with me, but the Wycliffe Bible translators did a quote that I read years and years ago, and I've always remembered, and I included it in the sermon last night, was that um, uh, we, if you're a believer, can never get more of the Spirit. Can't do it. But the Spirit can get more of you. Our obedience allows the Spirit to get more control of us. Well, Jesus is perfectly obedient and therefore the spirit is completely in control of him and he is completely in control of the spirit the, the two are one I'm not trying to say there's but do you see that they're, they're saying here is there no one in whom is such as the spirit of God right okay well that's just a picture of Jesus nobody can have more of the spirit than the person that is completely in harmony with 
what the Spirit demands, and that would be Jesus. So it's a picture of him. Then, as I said, he is elevated to the right hand of God. As I said in the sermon last week, in Mark 16, 9 is it, where it says uh, he ascended to heaven, and there he sits at the right hand of God. And then in the book of Acts, it says he's at the right hand of, the God, and it's, uh, of God. And it says it several times in the New Testament. This is just prefiguring Jesus. Everything that you're seeing here is prefiguring Jesus. Um, got seven years and seven this and seven that. Um, we'll go on from there. But anyway, um, uh, where were we? Um, 41. 41, please, go ahead. Somebody else, Somebody else 41. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. <coughs> he dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Okay, once again, symbology of Jesus in in a uh, 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 set way. The signet ring shows authority. And uh, he clothed them in garments of fine linen. You read that symbology in the book of Revelation. I quoted it in the sermon last week. It's uh, Revelation uh, 1, is it, or 2? Let me turn there real quickly. And uh, where are we? I think it's Revelation 1. Turned around to see. I hope it didn't turn. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Oh, where are we? Okay, yeah. <clears throat> I, I turned to see the voice 12, 112, that spoke with me. Having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands in the midst of seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. So the necklace here is probably a big Egyptian gold necklace, right? It's one of these things. You see like on uh, Pharaoh or Tutankhamun, that big thing that's around him. Same thing. He's got the gold the, 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 the authority of Pharaoh, well, he's got the authority of God, and he's got these fine linen that he's garmented. in. Same thing here. All of this is picturing the work of Jesus at one point or another in his ministry. So uh, uh, Pharaoh took his signet ring off, put it on Joseph's hand, and um, Joseph, as I said, it, 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 as you go through the Bible, he is currently a picture of Jesus. Somebody else will be a picture of Jesus later, and this will go on. Yosef means, uh, what does Yosef mean? Uh, Joseph. Eh, I don't remember. Anyway, I'm sure his name has something to do with that. But um, Okay, go ahead. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And men shouted before him, Make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Okay, now this one says, Bow the knee. Okay, when it says make way, it, it's literally bow the knee. In other words, get out of the way and submit to him. Well, what does it say in the New Testament? Quoting Isaiah from the Old Testament, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to God the Father. Another picture of Jesus. You'll just The whole thing is just picturing him all the way through. Okay, 44. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all Egypt. Okay, what does Jesus say in Matthew 28, 18? He says, all authority has been granted to me on heaven and earth. Go and therefore make disciples and uh, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All authority has been granted to Jesus. Picture after picture after picture, all the way through. Go ahead. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zaphonath Paneah. Okay, let me see if that, they tell what that means here because my other Bible does in this one doesn't. Does anybody have a footnote that says what it means? It means it, it does have a meaning. It's a, a, a uh, Egyptian name. I could look it up in Strong's Concordance, but I'm not going to. I, somebody should have a footnote somewhere that says what Zapanapanea means. It's they like. They have been trying to make Joseph more acceptable by giving the Egyptian uh, an Egyptian name and wife. He probably wanted to, one, play down the fact that Joseph was a nomadic shepherd and Occupation disliked by the Egyptians. Considered an abomination. We'll learn that later when they bring up the son and the, the father and the brothers. You know, to make Joseph's name easier for the Egyptians, Egyptians to pronounce and remember. And three, show how highly he was honored by giving him the daughter of a prominent Egyptian official. But it doesn't tell what Zapanathanea means. Well, it does. So you got it? No, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> When I went into the Bible, yeah. I didn't have it. I picked up the compact Bible dictionary. Oh, good. And it says, mm -hmm. Zaphonath Panea, the one who furnishes the sustenance of the land. Okay, there you go. And I read that before, and, and my other Bible footnotes that and tells me, but like I say, this brand new Bible, and I've never, never gotten any pages in here, so the one who sus provides sustenance to the land. 